Welcome to the Anime Research Group, a show about the weird and wonderful mistake that is anime. I'm Ian. I'm Danny. I'm Freya. And this week, in our quest to watch all the shows we never had time for, we draw each other like one of our French girls in Le Portrait de Petite Cosette. How was the French accent there, Danny? Uh, it was fine. It was fine. Le Portrait de Petite Cosette. Le Portrait de Petite Cosette. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we ended up with, with that because Ian wouldn't accept Simpanade Easy. And I'm not allowed to have an opinion on these. Yeah, you don't. You're you're allowed to have an opinion. It's just that by the time we've started recording, it's too late to have the opinion because yes. I've written it down in the sheet. <laughs> I like simping in easy. It makes me laugh. I just didn't want it to be the thing we said, <laughs> but now we've said it anyway. Uh, I just needed it to, to be out there so other people can judge who was right. Uh, before we talk about what we've been doing since the last recording, we have some content warnings this week. For the first time in a while, actually, we've been pretty good. The main things that you might need to watch out for is there is instances of torture uh, in this anime. Uh, I think that's a fair to say. It's quite yeah. gory, but the torture is the main thing. Also, I wouldn't call it like a full lollicon anime, but it's definitely a partial lollicon anime. Cosette is a young French girl, and she is the object of desire in this show. So take care with that. <laughs> Yeah, as I said, uh, what have we been up to since the last recording? Denny? Well, I've not really watched that much anime. I've mostly just been keeping up with the seasonal shows, um, watching the Inuyasha sequel, which has moved on to being Monster of the Week stuff, but it's fine. Jujutsu Kaisen is probably my favorite shonen adaptation of the last few years. And other than that, I've mostly been playing uh, video games when I'm not working. I've been playing Titanfall 2, uh, the multiplayer, now that I finally have an internet connection. God, is the movement system in that game great. And it's a shame Apex Legend killed whatever Titanfall 3 was going to be. And some of Spider-Man Miles Morales. I'm sadly not going to get a PS5 for quite a while. But hey, listeners, if anybody wants to send me a PS5, I'll gladly take it. Yes, Uh, we spend $700 on this podcast. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is something that we haven't done. (laughs) Certainly not. How about you, Ian? I've been watching anime. I've been reading about anime. (laughs) That's what I've been doing. I've actually been reading, uh, I, well, I finished Jonathan Clements' Anime of History, which has so much like useful information in it. It's actually, it's really impressive. I, I, I quite recommend it. Although I would say about half of the book is pre-Tezuka. So you have to be really be into like what happened to Japanese animation during World War II and uh, what were the influences of like the French animators and stuff like that. But there's a lot of good stuff in here. I think most people would get something out of it. I've seen Jonathan Clements uh, talk a bunch of times. Uh, uh, Scotland Loves Anime because he does the uh, pre preamble for most of yeah. the film. Nice. Uh, yeah, I, I read Ballroom A Yokoso. That was okay. Uh, not great. It was fine. It, it was a sports show, uh, sports uh, manga. But the main thing is I did finally finish watching Sakura Quest. I really like the second half of it where they turn more to being like introspective, shall we say? Like they're they're definitely um they're definitely thinking a lot more about like the needs of the town and like bringing back an old festival from the town. Um stuff like that. It ended up it ended up being quite sweet. Except for the final episode where they brought in the guy from the French town that Sandal San is from, and he's just <laughs> He's just the cat. He's just the president, but French. <laughs> that was a bit too much for me. Uh, I actually like this more than I like Shirobaku, uh, because I think Shirobaku has a lot more annoying stuff in it, like uh, Taro, who should just have gotten sacked. Uh, so yeah, I, I haven't changed my views about it being like a three star show or whatever I gave it, but I, it was enjoyable enough. I, I enjoyed it. How, how about you, Fran? Uh, I've also mostly been watching seasonal things. Denny and I have been watching more Hypnosis Mike. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're a few episodes behind, but whatever. It's just a fun show to watch. It has a lot. It has a lot of problems, but yes. <laughs> uh, and apart from that, watching Taisho Samurai, which uh, is all right. I I just feel like it. We're in episode five now, and it still feels like it hasn't decided what it wants to be. Does it want to be a serious sports drama? Does it want to be a comedy, a lighthearted comedy about a father and daughter? Does it want to be about an athlete and his uh, slow decline? Like, 
Or does it just want to be a wacky, weird hijinks show? And I feel like it's leaning towards the latter. This is this is a little sad because I was hoping that it would be. I don't want to say the next year on ice because nothing will be the next year on ice, but like the ne- the next sports show that I'm actually really going to be into. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't know if you've seen the latest episodes, but I don't think it's veering that much towards. Uh, I mean, I'm not. I'm like, I'm like an episode behind. So the last I watched was episode four, I think. I definitely prefer when it's focusing on the uh, family stuff. I don't yes. think the sports uh, aspect is that. Great. I agree. I agree. Also, I could do without the uh, random transphobic stuff in episode two. Oh yeah. I also I've also been watching uh, Adachi and Shimamura, which is nice. Is 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 it is it really because like I I only I started reading that and I was not impressed and so I just dropped it really hard. But everyone else seems to really like it, so whatever. I mean, I have no idea what the book's like. Yeah, I, I gave it a hard drop. <laughs> that doesn't tell anyone any useful information. It, it doesn't have the je ne sais quoi of the Ian likes. <laughs> it's no gondoliers on Mars. We can say that for sure. But what is Ian? What is? Well, Aria is. But enough about Aria, <laughs> Danny. Please, please tell us all about Le Portrait de Petit Cosette. Le Portrait de Petit Cosette is a series of three OVAs, each about forty minutes long, that were released between May and December two thousand and four. You've just got to flex on us every time you say the name. Yes. Yes, it's good. Uh, (laughs) They were made by Daomi, a studio that's no longer in the business, having ceased to make anime after Ushiki in 2011. And even before that, they mostly just adapted light novels and visual novels and such things. Can we just can we just talk about how trash all Studio Daomi stuff is? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they were mostly just adapted stuff. Well, like they they did so much trash, like Deers in Onagai Twins. Like mm-hmm. I think Minami K may be the best thing they ever did, but Minami K or Shiki. Someone I follow uh, sway, uh, swears off on Shiki all the time, <laughs> uh, as in it's good. Mm. I didn't like it. The the bits I've seen of it. I mean, we thought it was funny how the guy died in the first episode, but that was about it. There was also a two-volume manga version that was released later in 2004 that played out in some different ways to the anime. The anime itself was planned as an auteur piece by Akiyuki Shimbo, famous for Madoka and many other things I don't need to mention. If you're really interested in Shimbo, you should go listen to our Arakawa Under the Bridge episode because we have a very long piece there about him and the studio. And producer Masatoshi Fujimoto meant to show off his own style and uniqueness. The series was not a commercial success in the end, though. In an interview with Shimbo and Fujimoto, they stated that apparently they never even thought about the commercial side of the project, which I find quite interesting because most anime are made as a direct product to be sold to an audience and not like a complete disregard for the audience doesn't generally turn out well. So, Denny, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say this uh, now. I don't know how accurate it is, but I want to do like some research into how the OVA market worked. But mm-hmm. what I think is happens with this sort of stuff is that the reason we got a lot of crap, oh, crap that was direct to video, like um, Dracula that we did in the Halloween episode, as well as weird stuff like this, is because they didn't need to sell it to an audience per se. They were selling it to video stores. Um, yeah, okay. and the and so this is accounts for like some of the more experimental stuff that we see okay uh in the same interview they further state that the project kind of spiraled out of their control they started with the base idea they had and then they just kept adding and adding and adding anything and everything they wanted eventually resulting in cosette Shinbo himself also storyboarded and directed all of the ep- all the episodes of the show, which I think is quite unusual because mostly you have a series director and individual episode directors, right? Yes. Yeah, that's enough for now. We can't really talk much more about the episode because there's it's just so weird in a way. So I think we'll go to Ian now. Give us the plot summaries. Okay. So yeah, um, the fact that it was like thoroughly storyboarded and directed by Shinbo tells this is probably the most shimbo thing i've ever seen Mm. and as discussed in the arakawa under the bridge episode i have seen pretty much everything shaft has ever put out that's because shaft style isn't shimbo style there we go 
that's the summary of Arakawa Under the Bridge episode. Um, but this is one of those uh, narratives which is relatively straightforward, but it's not expressed very straightforwardly. It requires a little bit of interpretation, some care when you're viewing, and a lot of it is just going to be dialogue between our two main characters, uh, Cosette and Eri. But we'll take it in order. So with episode one, Eri Kurahashi is a man who is experiencing his first love, and this is very obvious to his friends. However, as he rushes to his job at an antique store, we quickly realize that the object of his affections is an object, not a person. Uh, more specifically, it's a goblet, a Venetian glass goblet. Uh, and as he holds it, he experiences visions of a young girl. Uh, this will be the titular Cosette. So a friend of his, uh, Shoko Mataki, comes around to check up on him, and she decides to drink tea out of this glass goblet, which is a big no-no in my book, but whatever. Eri is curious to see what happens because he allows her to use it, but he later snaps when it drops to the ground while they're having an argument. He shouts it. It's just like killing a person. He kind of realizes as he calms down that Shoko could not see Cosette either, that he's the only person who is seeing her. So she starts to consume him, uh, Cosette, not Shoko. <laughs> Uh, he draws pictures of her, he gets ex frequent visions of her, the visions get more and more extreme. Eventually he experiences one where he kills Cosette. And during these visions, he's told that if he doesn't want to be separated from Cosette, he needs to drink blood from the goblet, which he promptly does. But moving ahead to the next day, a rich man has come to buy these glasses from the antique store, um, like the case they came in, etc., etc. And so they rip him off. He can handle it. And so as they prepare to move all of this to the to the man's house, they find the titular portrait inside the case of it. And it is here that we learn both the identities of Cosette the Auvergne, or however her name is pronounced, <laughs> uh, and their murderer, uh, which is the person who painted her, Marcello Orlando. They deliver the goods, Eri heads home, and he gets a vision of that man and his mistress dead. Oh no, it's that man again. Uh, but also a vision of him turning into a beast which lunges at Cosette. This vision lasts pretty much to the end of the episode. It's going to provide a lot of exposition about Cosette. She's been searching for 250 years for someone that could see her and would agree to the pact of blood. Uh, and in this way, Eri is confirmed to be the reincarnation of Marcello. And she says that he has the duty to answer for Marcello's sins. This is like the introduction arc. We'll get the development of this in the second episode. A lot of this is just going to be Airy talking with Cosette, uh, which we do at the start mm -hmm. until uh, they're interrupted by one of the local workers, Yu Saiga. She's had some visions that Airy is like bad stuff is going to happen to them. And this makes Shoko jealous. But once Shoko calms down, she shows Airy her research into Marcello, including images of Cosette. We also learn that Airy, who is an artist, his style has changed to match that of Marcello. So he chats with her at home. And we learn various things about Cosette, that she doesn't actually like being the subject of drawings. She doesn't even want to hear Marcello's name. Uh, and we get a nice scene where she jumps from the balcony, and this causes the portrait of her that's hanging up to fall and get damaged. So Eri keeps trying to bring up the subject of the portraits and Marcello. He says he's jealous of Marcello for seeing the smiles of Cosette that he had seen, uh, and for his artistic ability. But... Like the main thing we are sort of picking up from this is that he was chosen by Cosette precisely because he's an artist who was in love with her in much the same way as Marcello was. And the, this is part of the reason why he's never going to really understand why she reacts to Marcello this way is because, uh, well, she was killed by the one she loved and he is this reincarnation of the one that she loved. We're going to see this a bunch of times in the episode where in order to punish him, uh, we enter a sort of a spirit world, like a, an alternate reality where Cosette is torturing and crucifying Eri. And then she's doing this in part to purify the objects that were cursed by her murder. And this is takes up a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. uh, but to, prog to progress on a, a little bit, Shoko will find him later in the antique shop with like the scar where his heart is. And she'll be very excited by this. Like, not excited in the happy sense, but like, agitated and she tries to uh, get him some new clothes but this is when a priestess from the local shrine who has like been paying attention to the spirit world 
takes him to get one of the cursed objects and tries to exercise him uh, of this deal with Cosette. So this leads to another symbolic fight scene with Eri in, in a clockwork world and Cosette trying to uncurse a new object. Eri doesn't want to die, though, and he's feeling a lot of pain. He's upset and he ends up grabbing Cosette. And then this is when he gets a flashback of him murdering Cosette. And this is when he sort of resigns himself to the fate of being punished because he doesn't want to hurt this fragile creature. Um, episode three obviously has to be our resolution to this. Cosette and Eri have both had realizations as to what's happened at the end of the last episode. Uh, but Eri has sort of resigned himself to this fate, where Cosette, on the other hand, is like horrified about what she's been doing to Eri. Uh, she's like no longer sees him in the, as just Marcello. And so she says her goodbyes to him, and the goblet which she always appeared in shatters. This causes Eri to panic. He starts smashing up the antique shop. He's desperate to find her. This is when some of the characters, other characters we've met, arrive and see him crazed and covered in injuries, and he flees the scene with Shoko chasing after him. Again, we have another cursed object trying to attack him, but this time he convinces the object that he should be taken to save Cosette. And then we get a music video. <laughs> but after the music video, Eri finds Cosette in the spirit world thing, and they reconcile. Eri says he wants to paint her, and Cosette decides to agree to this. They ascend up this tower, they're talking about what's going to happen, and the walls are starting to drip and fall apart like rotten meat. Eri starts drawing her at the top of the tower in a sort of a cage, and she's complimenting him on the drawing, almost seducing him, and demanding that he tells her that, she, that he loves her. But Eri's realized that this isn't right, and that this isn't the real Cosette, this is the Cosette from the portrait painted by Marcello. And this causes parts of the world to shatter around them. We get a lot of taunting from the fake Cosette uh, to Eri. She believes that she's better than the real thing and that she should be loved over Cosette. But Eri rejects this. And in the climax, we see him painting a picture of the real Cosette using his own blood and rejecting the Marcello inside of him. While we see the other paintings of Cosette burn, which finally releases the spirit. So when the painting is finished, Eri collapses to the ground and this is where Shoko finds him. And she mm. tells him that his art is much warmer than Marcello's. And then it just kind of resolves from there. So I think the plot actually comes across a lot more straightforwardly when you tell someone it than when you watch the show. Though I would like to say that this is only Ian's interpretation of the plot because he's written those summaries. <laughs> uh, uh, Ian's been relatively objective with this. Yes. So, so I do think that there is um, a lot of scope to br to bring into like some interpretation. For instance, um, in my opinion, in the first episode, the fact that the man and the mistress are actually dead, we 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 definitely see it like as a vision. But to my interpretation, it makes the most sense if it actually happened. Um, I don't know what your opinions on that are. <laughs> I'm I'm personally of the belief that nothing actually impacts anyone besides Eri and uh, that one bit in episode two where the monk woman, the female priest, gets knocked back. I don't believe there's actual massive damage going on in the real world caused by Eri. I've, I do believe it's mostly just a metaphor confined to the other world. What do, what do you think, Freya? Uh, I think it's mostly affecting him and those he has relationships with. Like, I definitely would agree that most of it is, like, just or is or is may as well be a metaphor but he takes real pain in it we see real scarring on his body and shoko does end up in a coma that's why i say it's uh, yeah. reflecting those around him which is why i don't think the random client and the his mistress are close enough to airy to be affected by this I think if I were to say anything, it would be like the cursed objects being bought by them and like being separated in part from the other glass might cause them mm. to lash out. Because like when we see Cosette in front of it, well, like we see Eri's hallucination of Cosette sitting in front of it. She's like very upset that like they're all there. But obviously Eri has secreted this one goblet that he keeps at his house. Another point of contention that I think we raised in our pre-discussion was the question of whether Eri is dead at the end. Can we save that till the end? Yeah, we, we could save that, but I think me and Freya are both happy and are both in camp Airy dies. 
Yeah. Uh, and Denny is in the camp. Eerie survives. I mean, the main thing with this show is that it's kind of hard to talk about if you haven't seen it, because <laughs> 90% of it, I've, I'd say, comes from the visuals. I, I think the reason yes. that it's most interesting to people is the visuals. I think that the story itself is kind of lackluster. It's man finds magic item that has woman trapped inside of it. Man falls in love with the item. Item tortures him. <laughs> Then um, the object tortures him until they both realize that how much they love each other slash want to, him to survive. <laughs> then it, the object goes away and leaves him alone, and he can't handle this, and so he goes crazy. It almost feels like it would have been better as one large music video where you pick the best bits of each of each OVA and just combine them with the with the score. And that way you don't have to bother with all the plot stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then we can remove the extraneous three people. Yes. Because usually we use the characters as kind of guidelines through these stories. But the characters are really kind of paper thin when you think about it. There isn't that much to either Eri or Cosette or Shoko or anyone in the show. I'm not sure I entirely agree. Like, let's yeah. start off with Cosette, for instance. Mm -hmm. So Cosette is, like, nominally one of... Uh, not nominally one of our main characters. She is one of our main characters. Although... <laughs> She's arguably the main character. Although she can only really interact with Eerie, which does limit her ability to, like, fully get realized, I guess. it's mm. Especially because, like, partly we could think of this as mostly being in Eerie's head. This is very much a psychological show in the perfect blue uh, black swan vein. She's she's quite complex, actually, because she's got the... She's, I, we have no idea how old she was, but she her family had this patron artist, Marcello, and they loved each other, and they were engaged to be married. And then she gets murdered by him, and now she has been kept alive by the feelings of objects, uh, one of the themes in this show seems to be that, uh, that everything has a soul. But then she's found like a new incarnation of this person that she loved. And she's got this conflicted um, thing. She wants to torture him and make him pay. But at the same time, she also really does love him and has been like obsessed with him really for 250 years. And she also recognizes in the end that he is a different person. Which I think is the one of the central points of the show of because for three episodes we we towed the line of is Marcelo are Mar are Ari and Marcelo the same person and no they're not and that and that's and that's just very weird to do in a re quote unquote reincarnation story they're like actually no they're different people and all along yeah you can already see how we're kind of lost when talking about this show so Cosette is. Uh... Particularly interesting when you can trust her with the fake version of her in the third episode. Mm. Because yeah. that one, all it's doing, uh, at least until the thing he figures out that uh, she's fake, is playing to his whims. Yeah, like I, I, it's, it's very shallow, but uh, which is to be expected from a portrait. But she's really like the embodiment of Marcello that we actually see. Um, yeah rather than airy. Sorry, I mean, she's a, she's a literal object with a soul that's kind of taken on the shape of its creator in its obsession with beauty and staying in this kind of timeless world where nothing ever changes. Whereas yeah. Airy moves beyond that together with Cosette as they accept that Cosette can't really grow up, but she can move on. And Airy can let go of his obsession. And I really like that we never actually see uh, real Cosette again in the third episode. So, well, this is jumping ahead. I think at the very end of the end credits for the third episode, we, which is just the painting of Cosette, we do see her open her eyes. Okay, but she, she after uh, saying that she's leaving Airy, she never interacts with him again. Yes, certainly, certainly that way. But does that mean Cassette is dead, or she's just gone back to dormancy, or she's, yeah, she's just she's just moved on from him? We get the sequel. Le portrait de petit Cosette is just Cosette on her own, hanging out and not quite sure what what to do with herself now. 
shit, I spent 250 years waiting to torture the guy, so what do I do now? I don't really have a hobby. Well, I, th- I think that, like, actually, the fact that the glass is smashed is probably what releases her soul. But then mm, yeah. we have this additional uh, embodiment of her in the paintings, which leads to the fake Cosette, which only yes. go when the paintings are symbolically destroyed by the Marcello insert. It's all uh, about be- symbolism. Because the... Well, I mean, I presume... He- I presume that if he was alive, he might actually go around the world trying to actually wipe out those paintings, which would be <laughs> hilarious. Like the the whole point is that if Eri is Marcello, then Marcello by like overcoming the beauty is all that matters. This is the real Cosette, the one in the painting, not the one that's going to grow old and get wrinkles and have children, but is instead like this little French girl forever. Yes, Nabokov, eat your heart out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, suck it. Cosette is very interesting because of this. Um, like, I, I don't know if it was just an excuse to bring in like goth lolly designs in the in this quote unquote gothic horror, uh, but like we get a very we get a difference between the Cosette as she is portrayed when she is Cosette the memory, Cosette the person in the glass, and Cosette the fake painting Cosette. Both in how they all act differently and in their character designs. Girl, girl, um, Cosette is wearing a fluffy, fluffy pink dress. She's like always running around. She's like, we see a little picture of her with her dog and so on. Cosette, the modern version is, is a goth lolly, uh, <laughs> wearing black and like basically being kind of moody <laughs> for good reasons. And then we get this white dress for the fake Cosette, which is the painting Cosette. As in the like the embodiment of like the idea of him. White is both uh, representing beauty, but also being sterile. Well, pre- yes, precisely. Yeah, kind of also just the default empty color on which anybody can really put their mark on. Yeah, in a way, whereas whereas like pink is already a defined color, like because the original cassette was her own person she was a defined person with a personality she liked her dog she didn't like Marcello for good reasons and the black cassette she's kind of drenched in that color because you could argue that she's kind of caught uh, caught up in everything she can't really move forward she's trapped by the past trapped in the glass trapped in her like relationship with Marcello so the black kind of drowns out anything else around her which is every often when she's there, everything else either moves into bright white light uh, in like scenes at the end of episode one and uh, two when they're in like the fake woods, or it's like there's hope we're moving forward, or darkness when she's with Eri, she's inside the antique shop and things are looking grim. So it's not just in her character design; it is it is in her acting as well. So young Cazette has like a girlish innocence to her. She's very playful, whereas the uh, portrait Cosette is a tease. Uh, she's coquettish. And I think this is actually like a really good job done by Marina Inoue, who plays um, Cosette. This is her debut role as a voice actress, which is all the more impressive because uh, it's got this three characters in one style to it. I, I think I mentioned this when we did the Skip Beat, where she played Kyoko Mogami, but she won this role in a sort of a open audition thing so there were literally thousands of people she had to be out and she gave this cassette like this very delicate fragile voice mm-hmm. but not too kawaii if you know what i mean like there's no like oni chan <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean right like it's it's delicate but it's not annoying <laughs> and so just to recapitulate some of the stuff that i said when we talked about her in the uh, the Skippy episode, this is Armin Erler in Attack on Titan. This is Yuko Littner in Tangatop and Gurren Lagann. Apparently, she shows up in a lot of uh, the Shimbo Shaft stuff. Um, I, I reckon that's probably just because of such the, the impact that she made here. Yes, she's got she's got very good range uh, between uh, well all of these people, and she's very good at being um, angry. Uh, like the range thing is like particularly useful when we compare her say, with uh, Mitsuki Saiga, uh, who plays Eri. So she's she's kind of interesting because she's got a lot more experience playing male roles in anime than female uh, roles. I find that her male roles have a kind of a samey quality to them. I mean, not 
they're not bad per se, like, but I can definitely sort of feel the similarities between, say, Eerie and Kuranosuke and Princess Jellyfish, between Jinya and Reader Die. Even like, even though this is a female character, uh, Maria Ross in Fullmetal Alchemist. Uh, mm. I'm not going to disparage her. Uh, I think she's she's good in her own right, but I think she's definitely a victim of typecasting, which is what happens when you have a very distinctive timbre. Yeah, that it could just be typecasting. You're right. Eerie is the like central character. Everything quite literally revolves around him. Yes, he's the one that notices the glass. He is the one that is the reincarnation of Marcello. He is the one that goes crazy. He is the one with the harem. <laughs> <laughs> he's the one who gets tortured he's the one that gets tortured like i think it's kind of it's very important that airy comes across in like as a in like a more complex way and is not just boring um like how do you think that like he's they've did you think that airy was like a sufficiently complex character to pull this through or so to me airy is uh interesting mostly because of uh what he represents more than he is as a person, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But as a character, he has two modes. Kind of sad and uh, occasionally little bouts of anger. <laughs> I mean, we know a lot of things about him, but all of those things really kind of come from other people. We see other people, we see him painting and other people comment on his painting. We see his obsession with Cosette, but he himself is mostly just kind of bland in a way. Like, I don't really agree, but I, I think you're kind of just trying to, like, echo what Freya was already saying. But I think the main important thing here is that there are some stories where he either entirely rejects the premise that he is Marcello and, like, denies that and fights against it the entire time. And then there's another version of the story where he accepts it from the beginning and just accepts his role as the Jesus Christ figure in this anime. <laughs> um, but the thing, but the the thing that like makes him a little bit more complex is he's both right. He rejects it and then he comes to accept it, but then he is forced to reject the Cosette that is in front of him and that he could be happy with because it's not the real thing. And once he's like felt the real thing, I guess he's not willing to accept the fake, even though he could be. Re- I think he could be pretty happy with it, just considering that he had already just just kind of like accepted it <laughs> and in particular he distinguishes his uh <laughs> his feelings on um on art i guess from marcello pretty strongly <laughs> mm-hmm. in the end yeah because while while he was like very complimentary about marcello's like artistic skill he never really seemed to embody like marcello in the sort of predatory way that we see marcello in fact well we very we know very little about marcello right we Maybe he, Marcello was more like Eerie until he got so obsessed with his paintings. I mean, the main thing we know about Marcello is that he's involved with kind of a constancy with things never changing. With he's unable to accept that things can move beyond the beauty he's the beauty he's captured. Thus, he kills Cosette because he can't accept that her changing would mean that his painting is no longer a representation of everything, but just a glimpse into the past yeah i think that they're, i think that like they, they they played the line quite finely and he they didn't always get it right but i definitely think that oh, the way they played him was much more interesting than this could have ended up and i'm I think i'm grateful for that yes mm-hmm. for sure one of the things i find interesting is it's just a single shot but there is this underlying notion of Marcelo being a lolicon due to his obsession with the underage cassette and the same going for um, Airy. And there isn't really anything else to indicate that in the show, except at the very op- beginning of the first episode, we see um, Airy with some other male friends uh, sitting in a cafe and there's two little grade school girls outside and he waves at them and smiles. And it's such it's kind of an odd shot because we don't really we don't see any of these characters again in the entire show. We 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 do see the male friends briefly in the second episode. What because they're being like, what the why where is Ari? Why isn't he here? <laughs> the, their entire job is to be, where's Ari? What Ari seems to have a girlfriend. I know it. But I'm wondering whether the, the two girls that were placed there in the in this first shot were kind of meant to to lead us to the conclusion that Eri might inhabit more of Marcelo than he uh, wants, just further tearing that line. Well, yeah, 
There are uh, a few other instances. Uh, there are several sequences in these episodes that are essentially just montages of Cosette doing uh, facial expressions and uh, poses that I'm assuming are supposed to be cute. But their placement is notable because the first one happens uh, when Airy is just, is the like montages of her that appear before Airy actually like talks to her in the first episode when mm-hmm. she's still wearing the pink dress. And the other one is in the third episode, uh, I think just after she's left. And at the very least, he needed to be uh, at least partially susceptible because he was falling in love with the cassette in the glass anyway. Yes. If we're to talk about the other characters, like we've already mentioned his friends from university who don't really seem to play much of a role. I think this is true of pretty much every other character except for Shoko. Shoko is presented very much as like the sort of like the obvious love interest. She's kind of interested in him. It's the one that all their friends think he would go out with if he was going out with anyone. I don't find her t- tremendously interesting in this uh, show because, like, she's just je- she's jealous whenever he's with other women. Uh, she like goes to see the tarot card reader to figure out like what's up with Aerie. She does chase after him in the third episode, and we do have her fall into the coma, which I think would be the shock of Aerie being like sort of spirited away by one of these cursed objects, especially because it's during a scene where it looks like he rips out his heart and drops it to the ground. <laughs> Which is a much more common thing in anime and media than you think, ripping out your own heart and offering it to somebody. I mean, it happens more than once in this show. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Symbolism. Uh, Which also would be the point where if Eri does die, he died there. Uh, And this is what precipitates her going into a coma. We pretty much only see her in relation to um, Eri. Which I guess you can say about everything in this show, but uh, Cosette is her own person. Uh, Shoko isn't really. I mean, we do see we do see her in a bunch of scenes with her female friends and hanging out on her own. So I th- I don't think it's quite correct to say that she's not her own person. It makes sense that everything is framed through her views on um, Eri because the whole anime is about voyeurism and observing every aspect of Eri's life. We're always watching him just as he's watching Cosette, which is why the camera is so often placed at weird angles because we're observing him secretly. Thus. Thus, yeah. using Shoko as kind of a different lens into his more normal everyday life, com- contrasting Cassette as the supernatural, the lens into his supernatural everyday life, makes makes some sense. This yeah. is what I was. This is what I would have said. She she's his grounding in the real world, um, but she's not entirely grounded because we do have this strange thing that happens while she's in the coma, where the damaged portrait appears above her bed, and this is actually visible to the other women who visit her in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, and when uh, the cassettes are finally freed at the end, that, that disappears. And I think you see it in the manga, it's implied that she is the reincarnation of Cosette. Uh, it's not implied in the manga, but I have read in several uh, interpretations of this, the argument being that since she shows up at the end, when Ares, like drawing the painting of Cosette with blood, she's the one who like enters into the cage and... The painting disappears. It's kind of assumed that the rest of Cassette's soul that was trapped has been assimilated into her, thus combining both of his loves into one person. Yeah, and this is why I was saying she wasn't entirely grounded, because she does manage to enter into the supernatural world at the end, where she meets him uh, as he is painting. I, there's not a lot to say about most of the rest of the female characters, either the deli worker who is just like a minor psychic. We have the tarot card reader who is just kind of there. We have the priestess and the doctor. One of the things that I would say sort of appears in this, like there's like a heavy like emphasis on psychic abilities in this show. Like the, like, the only person who really seems to be clued in from the beginning is the priestess, uh, Zenshini, uh, who is like, mm, bad shit's happening. And it's centered around the antique <laughs> shop. <laughs> and then she tries to exercise Aerie and fails. I mean, my thought uh, as to the inclusion of these characters is Shinbo does say in the interview um, that he maybe wanted this to be a TV show. And there's loads of things in the show that don't really work within the story, but make sense if you consider them to be setups for f- for the future. As in, these are things that we're introducing here in this OVA, and then they'll be developed further in a possible tv show he said more or less that the series composer uh, myri sekajima was left in charge of uh, these characters and uh he just kind of ran with it 
Yeah. And he said on the like um the interviewer brings up like it being like a harm show and he said, hmm, I guess that's what the scriptwriter likes. <laughs> Which is uh Yeah. This, you've you've never made one of those <laughs> like this. I'd say on his end, it's really mostly just about the art and the composition. So I think we should move yes. on to talk about that. He's he said as much in uh, other interviews. In particular, he's I don't know if he's that um, interested in the animation itself, which might be a slightly controversial thing to say, but whatever. Um, so um, if we do want to move on to the visuals, that's fine with me. But I think we should at least like highlight what we think the themes are, because a lot of the visuals are going to play into this before we do. So one of the things that Denny already mentioned was the voyeurism aspect. Um, yeah. And that's one of the most straightforward things that we see in the way this show is animated and directed mm. and storyboarded and composed. For example, throughout the first two episodes, certainly, we see a heavy emphasis on seeing things through a separate lens, whether that's a reflection in a sunglass through a goblet, sometimes through like stained glass, or oftentimes at an oblique angle underneath a table. Inside a cabinet looking out. So a lot of the places that we're seeing, particularly airy from, are not standard like this is where we're looking we're we're not seeing him through the eyes of other people we're seeing him almost through the eyes of objects that exist in the world mostly objects that have a translucent or transparent surface uh, glasses and so forth also meaning that the area we often see is kind of a distorted figure not maybe not necessarily who he really is but how he's observed by us strangers who don't can't really look into his soul yeah we're literally like uh, strangers looking through the window at, at, at the story, which kind of makes makes his like detached and cold personality seem much more reasonable because we are just strangers. We don't really know anything about Eri beyond the basic features. We don't really know what he wants outside of this obsession with Cosette and art, which I'm I would say is partially at least influenced by the fact that he's Mark Callow's re- reincarnation. But we don't really know anything about him as a person otherwise uh there's another um common motif in this which is they have these uh posters which were oh, yes. drawn by an artist who has the moniker okama which is slightly unfortunate uh, are these the ones we see at the end because i was thinking is, is this hirofumi suzuki who does the oil painting at the end or is it someone else no it's the um it's the, the eyes yeah, the posters of the eyes of various kinds. We often have um, scenes where it intercuts to them, uh, just to them, and usually it's like focused in on the eye. In particular, near the beginning, uh, during the quote-unquote opening. Notably, they're also plastered all over the ceiling of the storage room and yes. the uh, shop, which is where Airy like makes his art. So to me, it feels like uh, this is um, sort of him judging himself it's definitely a feeling of judgment i mean i guess it's an it's kind of an artist's uh self-awareness that other people will see his work and the eyes are always wide open and staring and making you uncomfortable yeah maybe that's like a metaphor for his own self-worth that he's doubtful that his art is any good even if other people tell him it's it's pretty good he's just questioning himself thus the eyes represent kind of the faceless public. And also Cazette, because he spends the whole two episodes judging him in a sort of. Uh, eyes also show up in the uh, <laughs> the Cazette dimension um, <laughs> as these giant floating, almost uh, Le Fleur du Mel uh, looking things. There's another French reference. Shout out to France this episode. Watch this anime on Bastille Pit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, one, one of the other things that made the voyeurism quite apparent is just how empty the world is, like sort of indirectly, right? Because the world is hyper-focused on Eri and his surroundings. And like, we don't even see people walking on the streets very much. It's like, he's the only person mm. in the world that matters. One thing that I got out of a lot of this was like the religious uh, symbology that was used. And it was a very syncretic use of religions. We were seeing like Shinto, Buddhist, and Christian uh, symbolism used in 
not a thoroughly wasted way. <laughs> Shall we say like that? Like oftentimes you can just sort of throw in like a crucifixion in anime because it's anime, right? But I don't think that's uh, I, I I don't actually think that's what's happening here. Like we've got this Shinto idea about everything having a soul and the the items that have transpired transported all the way from France are carrying these souls of the objects and also Cosette's soul and the needing to deal with their unrested spirits is like kind of how the sh- show needs to be. And there's uh, somewhat of the essence of the creator input into the objects. Yeah, that really comes to life with the uh, fake Cosette. So, because it, it's not just with Cosette, but also with, um, this is one thing that Zenshimi says when she's selling an item to the shop to begin with, about like how like so much of the items in her home, like remind her of her dad, like she's selling like like a sake like sake cups and she's like this is this like i associate this with him very strongly (laughs) like her dad's soul is trapped in his alcoholism but also themes of reincarnation which is again like japan isn't just shintoism it's buddhism as well although i would say the buddhism plays a significantly lesser aspect in here but as you transpire through your different lives you need to work through them and deal with the issues that come over from past lives and also to try and ascend to like higher states of being. And this also comes across in like a Christian way. I, I wasn't just being facetious when I described him as like the Jesus character. He is literally taking on the sins of Marcello and is being mm-hmm. crucified mm-hmm. for them. Mm-hmm. He is like taking on all of his pains and trying to deal with it quite sort of unfairly. Like he is being judged by people who judge them not father for they know not what they do sort of bullshit. I mean, it, it just makes sense for Christianity to be in because Cosette is French anyway. But it's all about it's all about this taking on the sins of another. And then at the end, he's actually ends up being more interesting than Jesus because he rejects this at the end, which Jesus didn't do. And like, I mean, you can say it's a bit of a stretch, but I, I but I think that there was a lot of crucifixions in here and they weren't just used like blindingly. I, I definitely think they were going for yes. this uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sins of the... F- well, the term would normally be like sins of the father, right? But in this case, the sins of yourself through your past lives. And in this sort of a thing, like by being exercised of like the, the sins through their actions, they do sort of ascend to this higher plane of being like moving past this, of freeing the unfinished business of the paintings and so forth. Because that frees herself in a way, which is interesting. Yes. Like, in fact, I, both of them free themselves, which yeah. rather, th- rather than the usual sort of way where they would free each other, which is always kind of a little, mm. okay, when it comes to me. Uh, <laughs> I think that's most of what I have to say. It's not entirely clear what the uh, alternative word world is. I'm not quite sure how to fit this into my <laughs> syncretic thesis. It just seemed because, like I say, it just seems to be a metaphor world in which the the resolving is happening. Maybe you could say it's just purely psychological. <laughs> I don't know, but it's telling because of like all the ways they mix the imagery. Like the tower is Cosette at one point, and they're ascending through it, and it's falling apart as Airy realizes that because the Cosette in front of him is not the real Cosette. There's a golden cage on top of it in which they're trapped. <laughs> he literally paints with his own yeah. blood <laughs> to to like. Prove like how, like like the artist killing himself for his own work couldn't be more apparent in this. Like, please, Shimbo, seek help. Yeah, <laughs> seek help, Shimbo. Well, it's interesting because um, while it's the show is presenting that as being better than the way Marcello views art, you know, as this <sighs> sterile thing you can you you just look at and. You can uh, serve. You can serve, yeah. It's made very ambiguous by the fact that, or at least to me, to the way I read it, that he um, he has to die for that to happen. And instead of ending on like an angelic, oh, he's ascended. Yeah, like him and Kazat are together in heaven, frolicking through the fields, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, what we get is he's staring at like the body of actual Kazat, presumably, and then there's just a loud... Um, there's a loud chord sound and he disappears. And that's the note we leave off on. Yeah, and like Cosette's death is kind of like implied anyway, because we keep cutting back to like her like lying in these fields of black flowers as it happens. Yeah. And Shoko um is while well, she assures herself that he's coming back, 
I, I don't know. It is, it's not how I read it. And in particular, we don't see Shoko. We're still viewing her through a glass object. So I, th- I think overall, I think there's been a lot of good um, reinforcement of the thematic stuff through the visuals. But I know Denny in particular thinks that Shimbo may have overdid it a little. <laughs> I do. Because when we look at this show, there are just so many different, interesting and varied visual styles and angles. And my kind of take on this is that if every single shot is something special and uh, unique, then no shot really is. We have, just to count a few, we have angled shots, just generic Dutch angles of a bunch of 90 and 180 degree angled shots. We have a TV static filter. We have a stained glass filter that scrolls by sideways, which happens once in the film. We have a faded film overlay that happens on a few times. We have shots, uh, the shots we've described where we just film through glass. We have the flashes of the eyes. We have the reflections that mostly happen in a character with sunglasses who doesn't really play any larger role in the story. It's just his sunglasses reflect very heavy. We have uh, we have some postcard memories. We have the CG Otherworld. All of them work within the context of the show. They make their respective scenes stronger. But the show might have been better overall if they'd picked like three or four of these and and just focused on those and maybe evolved them in interesting angles rather than just trying everything. But it makes sense when we consider Shimbo saying that they just kind of tried everything they wanted and threw it all against the wall and saw what kind of stuck, what things they liked for future productions. So I understand why it's there. I just don't like it all that much. The thing is, I think you've defeated your um, your argument in what you've said because they they do work within the context of the show, uh, and they are used relatively consistently to bring up repeated uh, repeated themes. I I will say to a certain extent in Denny's defense that when I watched the when I watched the first episode, I looked at it and I'm like, "Is this good?" <laughs> uh question mark not in the like this is bad way but in the it took me some time like this was a sitter uh in a way that say ghost town (laughs) wasn't like ghost town like i completely understood what all the like um like what all the composition choices were for this i needed to sit and think about it yes it definitely improved the more i thought about it but it was a. It was like this is a thinker for sure. Yeah, I don't think that makes it bad. I didn't say it was bad. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, to, uh, yeah. Another problem I have with it is that when I think of how to create psychological horror, I really think it comes from a contrast between the everyday normal life and the kind of more supernatural, the other world, the other thing, the thing that's strange needs to stand out from a baseline. And the film never really establishes a baseline because even at the introduction cafe scene we see, it's every angle and shot and uh, the cuts, they all just feel off, which is definitely the way it's intended because he's already feeling uh, like he's already obsessed with Cassette. So he's already part of the supernatural world. He's already being haunted. But I just think the show might have been stronger if we'd had a baseline normal world from which we can then move on uh, I, I i can i can maybe see where you're coming from like a through the looking glass moment but <laughs> yeah I, I the first 10 minutes of the show are just him with his friends and all these shots and the camera work is standard like basic anime um camera work and then we see him he, he goes to the shop he talks with shoko a bit they get a new package in that package is the glass he picks it up and then we can have the sort of looking glass and then then it turns out like the rest of the show. I disagree. I like how we're just thrown into it, and I like that they established that the baseline is that things are already weird. Like the fact that the first scene is all odd angles, uh, Dutch angles, 90 degrees, whatever you want to say, and shots of like only parts of people's faces mostly. Like it immediately like signals, oh no, there's, there's something horribly wrong here, or uh, things are off. I'm not saying you're wrong for wanting that, Denny. I think it might throw the pacing of the show off. The pacing of the show is kind of hard to like thoroughly establish, precisely because although it's a straightforward plot with a straightforward three-act structure, all the sort of visual choices that are made throw, throws it off a little bit, and I think that's intentional. Uh, so maybe it could have worked, maybe it couldn't have. I'm not 100% sure, but I will say that in a horror movie sense, like if you take, say, Scream, they don't spend very much time in the 
quote unquote real world like scream starts off with someone being murdered uh, in their house and the implication is that not that you should compare it to something within the anime but you should compare it to your own world like you already know what the baseline should feel like that's fair but shinbo himself says in the interview that he wanted to make the beginning ordinary to make it easier to watch then he failed then he failed no (laughs) what he's talking about there is the use of uh photos that have been composited to look like they've been drawn to make things ordinary no 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 he's he says, uh, we'll start with the ordinary life at first. I figured it would make it easier for the viewers to watch. If I were to begin with an unusual setting, people wouldn't be able to follow it. But he's specifically talking about that in the like context of the uh, backgrounds. But he's still making kind of the point of the ordinary life at first. And as you said, it's not really ordinary. It is already strange. Well, then he failed, but yeah. the <laughs> thing he made was better <laughs> I than, don't than what he said. The, the the specific use of like photorealism at times was one of the things I never quite knew how to evaluate because it's one of those things that particularly within an anime context, making something that looks real makes it look more than real. It, it makes it hyper real. And that works for making things feel off, but it's not like people are interacting in these hyper real backgrounds. They're just, they're, they are just like shots that we see. I don't know that it's bad per se. I just didn't know how to to interpret it. In particular, they are not used at all in the Gazette dimension. I also don't think that um, uh, CGI is used at all in the normal world, except for the cup. Uh, So they're definitely drawing distinctions between the two worlds. I'm not sure. I'm... I would have to. I'm making some some inferences here, uh, but and obviously, like this is just me pulling out of my ass. Um, but the use of some of the effects that they were doing, particularly with like the the uh, refraction in the glass, I have to imagine was at least a partially computer aided effect. And at the very and at the very least, one of the things that I singled out was the compositing work that would have needed to be done in this show to include yes. these things together. To his credit, in this interview, he talks a lot about what other staff members did, mm-hmm. um, which is not what I expected from him, but there you go. I think we've probably beaten beaten too much uh, around the visuals, so if you only have like one more thing to say about them, that's, this is probably a good place to end. Because for me, one thing that we do, like we've talked a lot about the visuals, but we haven't talked a ton about the animation per se. And one thing that I keep coming back to is how Cosette moves. I've yeah. kind of just been, uh, like, while we've been talking, I've just been staring at this one cut on Sakugaburu, which unfortunately isn't credited uh, to the animators. So I can't give them credit. But she doesn't move like a real person either. I notice this every time she crouches down. Her moves are too smooth. Like, and I think this uh, interplays with the fact that she's not real, so that she's this, like, dull creature. Everything's just too, too smooth with her. And, like, I think this is a good choice. And I think it was one of those things where, again, I would say it bothered me. I was like, hang on, this doesn't look right. And then I was like, ah, but it's not supposed to look right. <laughs> yeah. In particular, it's contrasted because there is uh, not really any other quote unquote smooth animation in this show. Yeah, I, I didn't bother. Like, I, like, I'm only looking on Sakagobu. I didn't slow it down. But yeah. This definitely feels like it got like, this didn't get the threes treatment. This got the twos or ones treatment. Yes, like in general, the show is pretty much entirely animated on the threes, it seems. Uh, I mean, I'm not the best at judging that, but. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any uh, final things that you would like to uh, bring out, Denny? Um, uh, what, oh, one of the, for, the other... for, posi- for positive or for ill. Yeah, yeah. The, one of the things that uh, I felt was interesting when I was watching it is that the character design of Cosette actually reminded me of a different show, namely Kakaguri, which. <laughs> It's kind of odd, but I couldn't really put my finger on it until Freya pointed out what it was. And it's namely the way Cosette's eyes look with their with her retinas being much larger than usual and yet not touching either the upper or bottom uh, end of their eyes, like how other anime characters do it. And that was just an odd thing I found out. And I assume that the reason that's done is to kind of highlight a larger sense of innocence because large eyes are often equated with like innocence and stuff. I was going to make a different uh, comment, which I never bothered to pay that much attention to Marcello or her parents, but was it like an attempt to differentiate her as a European? 
I mean, I don't think we ever see them, so... Uh... Well, we, we 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 see them, but like we see them in like weird positions. So I don't think I don't think it was something that would stick out anyway. Mm-hmm. And it is the blue blue eyes, like kind of the European. She has the Aryan blue eyes, blonde hair thing, which Japan really likes to use for Western characters. Well, I mean, she's the she, she yeah, like like she's the doll character. We would see the same thing in Ghost Sick, where the lolly mm. is blonde eyes, blue hair. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Fred? Any one final thing that you would like to? To highlight there there is so much going on in this show uh visually that i feel like it needs <laughs> it needs someone to do a proper full anal- analysis on it which ian has done a really good job in this uh podcast by the way but um domo domo yeah uh it needs it needs the full video or full uh essay treatment yeah you need like a shot by shot breakdown going into well, every shot just not necessarily, not necessarily that but yeah i'd say you might need to but yeah like i think that this show is one that even if people like just think of it as like pretentious arty bullshit which i'm sure someone has said at some point uh i do think that if you're uh, like an artist like this is a fantastic show to watch like there's just so much going on here and this is actually this is true of a lot of like shimbo shaft stuff anyway is that he's willing to go the extra mile just to make it obvious that he cares about this stuff and whether or not he he does it successfully or not or shaft does it successfully or not in a particular episode or a particular cut it doesn't really matter there's going to be a lot in there for you to just like think about think about why they use this things and i think that's just part of developing yourself as an anime fan or film fan or whatever this is an interesting point because this is basically the end of uh, shimbo as a um as a director in this sense, because after this, he becomes the supervisory uh, uh, figure that he, uh, be, uh, that he is in Shaft, although he's not really doing anything there either, anymore. So it's kind of interesting from that perspective, because it's kind of, uh, it's his quote unquote magnum opus. Um, yeah, he, he kind of, maybe he burned out. He's like, I've thrown every bit of passion I've had. I've, I've painted this anime in my own blood and now I'm done. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Yes. So there, are, there. you could make a reading of this show as um, Marcello versus Aerie as being Shimbo fighting with two different <laughs> versions of himself. Uh, but that's just a one reading you can do. It's also interesting because the production of this will have overlapped at least a little bit with him, with the beginning of his career at Shaft. And they're making uh, Ian's favorite anime, Tsukiyomi Moon Phase, um, <laughs> which would be interesting to do a comparison with that show and this show because they, they even bring it up in the interview. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Shibo kind of laughs it off um, more than anything. Moon Phase makes me so sad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is really kind of a show where listening to us isn't going to solve everything. I mean, you can see how we're still not certain about anything really about most things in the show even though we've watched it like multiple times it's just kind of such a visual uh, it's such it's just such uh. yeah i like i mean that that's kind of like a like it kind of sounds like a letter when you say it this way but like this show has like definitely made me rethink some of the assumptions i had about anime i hate anime now <laughs> yeah, I, I also hate anime now. Uh, don't be don't be stupid. You hated anime. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. Yes, you did. But like, I I, I feel bad for like the sound director, pe- the, like the sound people now, because we've 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 just lavished praise on the the audio guys, uh, on the uh, visual guys, and now it's not that they did a bad job, but there's no way we're going to be able to say as much about them as we did for this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There is a few things. Uh, a very interesting choice for how not at all con- uh, concerned with verisimilitude the visuals are. The audio in many scenes is done with a great attention to the um, the character's dialogue. It's sounding like it's coming from like the relative distance and location that they are to the camera. It even moves with them across the camera or off screen, which I really like that choice. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, me too. Like when when I think of the music in this show, the one thing that just sticks out is the the Exorcist theme. It took me a it took, like it was it was you Freya that pointed it out as this. Whereas like for me, I was like, is it ER? No, it can't be ER. Is it the X Files? No, 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 no. But when, as soon as you said the Exorcist, I was like, yes, thank you. Shout out to Mike Oldfield. I guess <laughs> because it was just kind of hilarious whenever I heard it. <laughs> uh, the the music in the show is very good. It's um, the composer is Yuki Kajiura, who you probably heard her music in something between uh, Sword Art Online, Fate Zero, Dot Hack. Uh, oh, and of course Madoka, uh, which is probably the similar, the most similar to this show in terms of sonic palette. But there's an interesting mix of yeah, like. Uh, there, um, sorry, just to point on that point, there was one point where I swear I heard the like Madoka Witch's domain music um, when where it turns into papier mache, papier mache in Madoka. I swear I heard that at one point, but it definitely <laughs> wasn't that. There's uh, an interesting use of um, sort of synth uh, percussion in this. So they have something that sounds like a glockenspiel, but it's definitely not a real glockenspiel, which gives it a slightly eerie uh, effect, which is good. Other things, we have Christian imagery with Buddhist chanting, or at least to me, more Japanese sounding chanting. I would say in the opening, I definitely felt a little bit more Christian chant singing, but um, yes. but like at other points, I could hear more of the Buddhist influence myself. Yes, so that religious element has worked its way into the music too, which is not terribly surprising. But in general, it's very good. There's also just some nice atmospheric uh, stuff going on. Like I, I'm wondering, like about like the Foley people and like how much glass they had to break <laughs> for this <laughs> to get like the right glass sounds for this show. I, I, I've also pointed there was one nice piano roll effect in episode three where the where there's like these dots appearing on the screen and that like would correspond to the changes in the the melody. Yeah, uh, that was quite subtle and very good. I'm not I, I'm not quite sure if there is really anything to say. Like they did about the opening or ending. It didn't really have an opening. Like I said, there was like some like high gothics uh, like. Mm. Gregorian chanting with like some images that were just flashed as eerie walked, but not a quote unquote real opening. Yeah. Uh, the ending, on the other hand, is sung by Marina Inoue, who, as you've already mentioned, was the voice actress for um, for Cosette, and it's called um, Hoseki or Jewel. I I kind of didn't know what I what to say about it when I heard it. It's kind of sad kind of plaintive there's some really nice violin work like it was it was like like a, almost like a sort of standard pop orchestration but they had added in these violins which gave it a different f- feeling yeah also only a bass guitar and no electric guitar from what i could hear which is an interesting choice officially there wasn't a whole lot to say about this there was this one really nice like i think it might actually be an oil painting but like a digital oil painting <laughs> Like not an actual oil painting, but you know, uh, done by uh, Hirofumi Suzuki, who I I mentioned earlier. Who's the animation director? Uh, was he the animation director for all of them? Because I, I think the third one had a different animation director. I think I think he had a help on the third episode. Uh, yeah, yes. the The other person credited for that was Takahiro Chiba, and I think yeah. I think it was I think there was a noticeable difference in the animation direction in the third episode. Yes. Um. But it's a beautiful painting. Uh, it w- it was nice to stare at, but they tried to cut it in with some additional illustrations in the third episode, but that didn't really add anything. Okay, here's some roses, here's some whatever. They might as well have stuck with the painting. But like, it was like it was nice that like they gave this to Marina in a way, uh, mm-hmm. considering that it was like her first show. It's like we also want you to do the ending. And she's got quite a good sonorous voice for it. So yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you noticed I'm quiet because I don't really have much to say about the sound and music overall. I There were a few pieces that I quite enjoyed, but otherwise, it really worked with the kind of show it was. But that's about it. Yeah, there was no J-Rock guitars for Danny to get excited no. about. So so, so he, so he start, stopped paying attention and I started. Mm. Uh, Shimbo. Shimbo has this, uh, there's a bit of the interview where Shimbo uh, says that if nothing else, people, I hope people like the music. Which is, which is a very Yoko Taro comment. <laughs> which really makes me think this should have been, once again, that this should have been a music video. Well, I mean, that we didn't mention it again after I, after I brought it up, but there was like the weird music video in the third episode. Yeah. And like, 
what the fuck was going on there? <laughs> Uh, Again, this is another thing to go back to. Uh, it was something we noticed in um, Yokohama Kaidashi Kiko, and so I wonder. Uh, again, I'm wondering if this was just a fad in OVAs. <laughs> um, Maybe, but like, it, it was like, okay, where are they going with this? And it's like, oh, they're not going anywhere with it. It's just a music video. Oh, we had fun, <laughs> and so with this, I think it's time for us to give it our rating. How would we really rate this? Like, do we rate this as a commercial product? Do we rate this exclusively as an auteur piece? Do we rate this on how much we enjoyed it individually? Yes, we already do it the third way. <laughs> You're encountering the problem with giving things a, a rating with numbers. <laughs> Out of five glasses, how many? How many glasses? How, how many, many antiques would you buy from this store? <laughs> okay, yeah, there, there will be two. Um, I mean, I think you can tell from this episode, I wasn't really a big fan of the of this anime. I certainly can certainly appreciate what they try to do, and I like a lot of the individual visual choices that were made. I actually quite like them quite a lot. Like, I really like the the way it's framed sometimes through the glass cabinets. I like a, some of the visual overlays, not all of them. I like the stained glass motif they've got going on for a lot of it, but then it's just kind of buried underneath the whole bunch of other ones. Story-wise, it's kind of a mess, and it's not that in, in the way that it's not a complicated story, but it just feels poorly told at times. I think for me, just personally, I think I have to give this a a 2.5. So straight average from Denny. Mm. Because there's a lot of good stuff there. It's definitely worth watching. You should watch this show. I'm definitely recommending it. But I'm never going to watch it again. How about you, Freya? So, um, there's a point in the interview where Shimbo says that, kind of related to what Ian said earlier, that he sort of made this to be watched multiple times, which is very funny considering what Denny just said, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Which we've all done now. <laughs> Again, I'll reiterate, I feel like this show needs to have somebody who's smarter than me, although I... <sighs> I could just uh, learn film theory properly and do it myself. Make a full analysis of it because both the blessing and curse of it is that it's open to a lot of different readings. Like there are some things that are like fairly easily supported, which I think we've done. And again, good job. Ian. As for how I feel about it. Uh, well, I liked most of the visual tricks they did, even if I don't think they worked all of the time. And I liked the sound direction and, I'm not sure how I feel about the themes. At the end of um, Miss Hokusai, I said that that sort of... Uh, the sort of slow, plotless character study is um, is my shit. At the other end of my shit is uh, messy, um, messy art movies, which I guess this falls into. And somewhere along the line, we'll get to the other spectrum of uh, that in between, which <laughs> is things are quote-unquote more standard, but uh, get their um, th uh, theme across really well. Four out of five. All right, which leaves me, and I, I posited this question earlier, and it was the one that came to my mind when I first watched it, which is, is this good? <laughs> and yes, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> um. I think like this plays a little bit more into me. I watch a lot of like the like Aronofsky uh, psycho thriller bullshit. Like this is my shit, right? Like we just need to slap a Satoshi Khan on it, get him to f get him to like f f to round it out. <laughs> and this is my shit. I can't in good. I don't. I don't think I can in good conscience give it a five because like it's not like the, it's not like when we watched Yokohama where like I felt that just everything synced together so well. And like, yes. I definitely think that the third episode is a little bit of a eh. so, but I think I could go. I think I'm willing to say four and a half here. This is definitely the episode with the most divergent ratings we've ever had. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is one of the few cases where I gave something the highest rating. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you've you've both said the kinds of movies you enjoy. Like, I I don't mind either of those, but for me, a movie really needs to come together by the end in a conclusive manner in a way to where everything that was shown in the film kind of worked towards something 
And I just don't think that happened here in cassette. At least to me. And I, and I don't agree. <laughs> I know, you like, don't. like, like, I, I partially agree, Denny, in that, like, I definitely feel that, like, they could have resolved it better than they did, and then they would have gotten the five. I feel like that this is that, like, this is just something I'm going to be like, hey, have you seen this? To like a bunch to like people out of nowhere, <laughs> like, oh, I want an anime recommendation. <laughs> have you seen the Portrait de Petit? <laughs> <That's exactly. laughs> I'm not quite sure where, where to go here, Denny. Like, what are we watching next time? <laughs> next week we're watching something much simpler. I think we're watching Penguin Highway. I don't know what that is, but I will point out, Denny, that you have now multiple times put up a show with Penguin in the title. Yes, yes. But this time, it's by the person who, uh, it's by the same person who wrote Tatami Galaxy and uh, Eccentric Family. So, on average, I'd say that there is more of a chance that this is better than Die Meadler. In terms of Penguin shows, there's Die Meadler, but then there's also Penguin Drum, and then there's Tuxedo <laughs> Gin somewhere in the middle. <laughs> ah, Tuxedo Gin. Having seen it, I... I uh... <laughs> I guess it's closer to the penguin drum end of the scale. Spoilers, <laughs> but not that much. You know, right now I'm just. You know, right now I'm just suggesting in the anime recommendations Penguin Day, and these are the shows I'm picking. <laughs> <laughs> we are the Anime Research Group, a weekly podcast coming out every Thursday, more or less. If you'd like to tell us what you thought of the episode or suggest something for future episodes, you can follow us on Twitter at research underscore anime or drop us an email at researchanime at gmail.com. Bye. Goodbye.